Henry James once made this comment. We do not expect great poems from women any more than we expect great pictures. A woman's mind, quite simply, was not the same as that of a man's. It could not accommodate creative genius, and to see a woman leave her own mental sphere and try to enter that of a man's was painful, if not pathetic. Existence in the shadows of a world-famous male author is daunting, especially when works of astounding measure gain notoriety as a result of association with that same man. Constance Fenimore Wilson lived in the shadows of author Henry James, and her works continue to do so even after her death. It is through her relationship with Henry James that Wilson's reputation has been damaged. This presentation covers a broader paper from which my thesis is based. In this presentation, I will focus on Wilson's early education at the Cleveland Female Seminary, Wilson's relationship with her teacher, Linda Guilford, her major literary works, tensions with her parents, artistry, and the importance of recovering her works. Constance Fenmore Wilson is a forgotten literary figure in the world of American women writers of the 19th century and beyond. My research, my research and work contribute to feminist revisionism by reconstructing Wilson's early life and history and recovering her literary works. Feminist revisionism in this project is the identification of disregarded literary works by Wilson and the recovery of Wilson's early life and relationships that impacted her works. Wilson's formal education and her relationships with both her earliest teachers and her late friendships prepared her to ascend into authorship superior to that of a man. My project will especially trace Wilson's early life in Cleveland as the foundation for her later writings, which examine Wilson's perspective on men, impression of women, and desires for women to dominate the literary sphere. Constance Fenimore Wilson's early education in Cleveland at Miss Hayden's school and the Cleveland Female Seminary along with the relationship with her teacher, Ms. Linda Guilford, influenced her feminist lens in her published works. Constance Fenimore Wilson was born in Claremont, New Hampshire on March 5, 1840. Writing and the satisfaction earned from reading a great novel was truly in Wilson's blood, as she was related to famous writer James Fenimore Cooper. Her mother, Hannah Pomery Wilson, was in turn the daughter of Anne Cooper Pomery, elder sister of James Fenimore Cooper. When Wilson began writing, she had a foot in the door, as she was recognized as being related to another successful author. Wilson was able to easily enter the literary sphere as a published author in magazines due to her association with her uncle, James Fenimore Cooper. Wilson attended the Cleveland Female Seminary, which was not a finishing school for girls, which is what many other schools of the time set out to achieve, but was rather a rigorous education like that of which young men were also receiving. As a student at the Cleveland Female Seminary, which she attended after leaving Miss Hayden's school, Constance first began to manifest that interest in the written word, which was later given to her distinction. Wilson's interest in reading later developed into an appreciation for writing and an interest in composing her own pieces. It was at the Cleveland Female Seminary where Wilson came to know one of her favorite teachers, Miss Linda Guilford. In a time when formal education was male dominated, one remarkable educated woman mentored another. Guilford was one of the first graduates at Mount Holyoke College in 1847, which was considered to be one of the first formal institutions of higher learning for women. Linda Guilford shaped the educational landscape in Cleveland, Ohio, and even has a permanent name for herself in Cleveland on the Case Western Reserve University's campus. Miss Linda Guilford was one of Constance's beloved teachers with whom she continued to correspond with after her time at the Cleveland Female Seminary. Wilson's education at the Cleveland Female Seminary was structured in a way that was more of like that of a contemporary school, like one can see young girls receiving today. She learned about social issues, history, mathematics, reading, and writing. Typically, girls in the mid to, 18, the mid to late 1800s were sent to finishing schools to learn to fulfill the domestic roles of housewife and mother. The Wilsons arguably were ahead of their time sending their daughter to a non-traditional school, unlike other parents. However, after Constance received her formal education at the Cleveland Female Seminary, the Wilsons fell back on tradition and sent Constance to a finishing school in New York for a year. I believe that Wilson's relationship with her parents exhibited tensions because on the one hand, they were supporting her aspirations to read and write, but they also urged her to anticipate a future as a married woman. Constance Fenimore Wilson's earliest published writing is commonly forgotten, as she was not the writer attributed to the story. 
Miss Wilson's first published volume, a book for children entitled The Old Stone House, appeared in 1872 under a pseudonym of Annie March. Wilson was one of many Am American women writers that published under a pseudonym. In Wilson's children's novel, The Old Stone House, Wilson supports young girls aspiring to be writers through the read aloud that she includes in the narrative. Wilson wanted to show her readers that men could not comprehend the capabilities that women had as creative beings or artists. According to Seaman, she also daringly wrote from a male point of view, frequently exposing the limitations of her male characters, ability to understand women's minds and motives. In Constance Fenimore Wilson's later work, Miss Grief, Wilson highlights the importance of her female protagonists having a strong female feminist presence. She also reveals that men hold power over women in their names as well. Wilson set out to write what other women of the time were not bold enough to put onto paper about how women, specifically female authors, were treated in the male-dominated literary space. In this thesis, I use feminism to describe the elements of Constance Fenimore Wilson's writing that demonstrate an awareness of the lack of support for independent women and the concept of supporting girls and women in these independent roles without the aid or validation of and from men. Her life was filled with these tensions and struggles. From early childhood and into her adult life, it is said that Constance Fenmore Wilson's father gave 12-year-old Constance a complete set of Charles Dickens' works and encouraged her early writing, none of which has survived. It was truly remarkable that the parents of a young girl in the 19th century were so supportive of their daughter's education and literary interests. Wilson's father encouraged her passion for reading through gifting her books. However, this was not his encouragement of Constance choosing to follow a non-traditional role, but to further promote her role as a domestic woman. Wilson's father desired for Constance to marry and fulfill the traditional role of housewife and mother. Fate asserted itself, however, when all gussied up to make social rounds and meet eligible young men, Wilson spilled a bottle of ink on her fancy dress. Spilling ink everywhere is a writer's nightmare. But for Wilson, this was a testament of her aspirations. Wilson wanted to model for her niece, Claire Benedict, that girls and women were capable of artistry. Through her drawings and few speech bubbles, Wilson is able to demonstrate to her niece that women are capable of completing tasks that are not traditionally intended for women. Wilson's one drawing, which she titles, Crossing the Ford on the Stepping Stones, depicts a mother and daughter crossing the Ford River on stepping stones while wearing Victorian dresses, high heels, and carrying parasols. In the drawing, we can see the daughter stepping from one stone to the other on the river while wearing her dress, carrying her parasol, and wearing heels, while her mother is telling her, you're getting your dress wet. The daughter can be seen replying, don't speak to me. The daughter is clearly not concerned with soiling her dress and is likely enjoying crossing the river. Through drawing these images, Wilson demonstrates for her niece that women can be adventurous and complete tasks just as men do. Wilson drew a whole collection for her niece of drawings that depicted women completing tasks such as climbing hills and even fending off a herd of cows with her parasol. Wilson, like many of the characters that she wrote about, was also involved in a rather wild and adventurous lifestyle as she traveled the world as an independent woman. Wilson traveled with her sister after the death of her mother. Wilson can be seen visiting the pyramids in Egypt with her sister, Clara Wilson Benedict, and her niece, Claire R. Benedict. The, the image of Wilson and her female family members on the backs of camels in front of the pyramids in Egypt demonstrates Wilson's belief that women are not subject to the limitations of the sheer fact that they are of the female sex. The image of the women on the backs of camels in the 19th century, nonetheless, communicates the capabilities of women. Wilson wanted to show her readers that men could not comprehend the capabilities that women had as creative beings or artists. According to Donna Seaman, the author of the article Resurrecting an American Writer, she also daringly wrote from a male point of view, frequently, limiting, frequently exposing the limitations of her male character's ability to understand women's minds and motives. In Constance Fenmore Wilson's later work, Miss Grief, Wilson highlights the importance of her female protagonist's strong presence. Critics and scholars speculate that Wilson's story, Miss Grief, is actually written from accounts of her life and her relationship with famous author Henry James, whom she met while she was living in Europe. Similar to the male author in Wilson's Miss Grief, James loathed female authors and was arguably jealous of their successes in comparison to his own. 
Wilson is often the forgotten figure when it comes to documenting authorship. In all the Henry James biographies, Wilson appears as a shadowy presence whose morbid anxieties simply echo those of the master himself. She was writing in the shadows of James and was never praised in the same way that he was, although she was indeed successful and a prolific, prolific author. Wilson was an important figure in James's life. However, scholars have silenced Wilson's influence in James's life. Wilson's work is now being considered for what it is, a feminist lens in the 19th century, a time of significant female oppression. Wilson and James read each other's writings and critiqued them before seeking publication. James argues that a woman is incapable of greatness and suggests that women, when they try to achieve greatness, they are attempting to enter a man's mind for guidance to aid in that creation. And yet, he clearly valued her opinion. Wilson did not need James to rise to literary fame because she had already been established as a prominent writer. According to Sharon L. Dean, Wilson had a well-established literary reputation. The March 1886 issue of Harper's New Monthly magazine that was serializing Wilson's novel, East Angels, also featured a full page photograph of her. The photo appears in connection with an essay by Edmund Kirk on the city of Cleveland, including its noble writers. But though William Dean Howells and John Hay are also mentioned in the article, only Hay gets a photo and it's considerably smaller than the one of Wilson. Harper's valued Wilson enough that it used her photograph again on the cover of a February 1887 issue of its weekly. At the very end of her writing career, Wilson was able to finally dominate the literary sphere and the male writers that constantly overshadowed her. Wilson's full page photograph is a testament to her impact on both Cleveland and the literary domain, and yet lost again today. <laughs>